Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Patcast. Today is Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. I'm Rifat Manan in California. Today, we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Lester Thompson, who needs no introduction, who is the renowned uh, head and neck pathologist we know well, and he is here today for the second part of his talk on update on WHO classification of head and neck tumors. And as always, uh, to our viewers, please feel free to post your questions and comments on Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and we will pass them on to Dr. Thompson at the end of the talk. And thank you, Dr. Thompson, for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to try and share some of the updated information, especially around a area like this that can be quite remarkably um, complicated um, as a uh, topic. So with that, let's start off with um, part two of this particular discussion. Uh, we had done part one last week, so if you want to go back and review some of those elements, obviously I will not be repeating any of them, but I will repeat the disclosure as being a member of the Standing Editorial Board for the World Health Organization, and then of course serving as an expert member for the fifth edition of the um, Head and Neck book specifically. So the last time I had gone over sort of organ specific sites for the first talk, and now I'm going to go over more of the generalized topics that were discussed. And in this particular case, uh, we're gonna start off with the soft tissue tumor category. And as you can see, um, similar number of diagnoses from what we had for the 2017 edition. However, what we really chose to do in this particular case was to uh, really put um, all of the soft tissue lesions into a single uh, chapter. So uh, there are some exclusions to that, things like uh, glomangiopericytoma or perhaps biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. These are entities that are specific to an anatomic site distribution within the sinonasal tract. Same thing with sialolipoma occurring specifically within salivary glands. And so those were included um, in a very specific um, site and therefore uh, are still maintained in that group group, and yet all of the rest of them have now been aggregated so that they are not repeated. So let me just say that something like a um, lyomyoma or perhaps a lipoma, these can occur anywhere within the head and neck space, and yet they are being aggregated into this chapter. Several new entities were included, the EBV-associated smooth muscle tumor, phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor, extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarc, and of course the GLEE-1 altered soft tissue tumors, and then of course updating on some of the other names were also incorporated into this chapter. So let's go into the new entities specifically. As you know, the EBV-associated uh, tumor, this is one that really um, is defined by its association with EBV and, of course, in the setting of immunosuppression. And it's a tumor that shows smooth muscle differentiation. Now, importantly, the patients usually have some sort of transplant history as the most uh, usual uh, event. However, the immunodeficiency can be caused by a variety of other lesions as well, such as HIV infection or even malnutrition. Now, histologically, it does look like a smooth muscle tumor, but quite interestingly, they are often very small, short cells, um, and they can have um, nuclear atypia and pleomorphism. And so sometimes the separation of these tumors, in fact, from lyomyosarcomas can be quite challenging. As you would expect, any of the muscle markers are positive um, with uh, EBV as identified through EBER in situ hybridization are part of what is definitionally required for the tumor. So here you will notice an intact surface epithelium. Underneath it is a very uh, short fascicular architectural arrangement, very, very um, small cells. In fact, they look almost a little bit like a blue round cell tumor. However, they will be positive with Desmond and obviously with a other variety of smooth muscle markers, but by definition must have a strong reaction in the neoplastic cells with Eber um, as a representation of the Epstein-Barr virus association. One of the other tumors that was now incorporated is the phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor. Um, this is actually a group of neoplasms, right? It is not a single tumor category and instead is something that is incorporating a whole variety of tumors that all have tumor-induced osteomalacia. And this is usually through the production of either fibroblastic growth factor 23, which then will be um, secreted and actually can be elevated in the peripheral serum in many of the patients as well. So uh, the phosphate wasting or osteomalacia is one of the most common associated findings for this tumor. And in fact, 
um, in the head and neck is the most uh, second most common anatomic site that is affected, with about 50% of them occurring in the paranasal sinuses. So they tend to be this kind of bland to ovoid spindled and stellate type cell uh, population. And then having this basophilic or smudgy matrix or grungy flocculent calcification is quite characteristic. Although in the head and neck space, it is often quite limited. In other words, it's very minimal. Sometimes it's even absent. It is also important to recognize that other things can be seen, such as adipose tissue in some of these lesions as well. And then, of course, they are going to be positive with a variety of different markers. But the one that is the most sensitive, of course, is the fibroblast growth factor 23 or FGF 23, which can be done by a uh, in situ technique as well. So radiographically, they can present as destructive lesions. So there is not a sense of malignancy or benign tumor. In other words, this is the reason why tumor is used in the name, because it can be either benign or malignant. Here you'll notice a spindle cell population, um, rich vascularity in the background, some of this uh, background blue material, but not nearly as well developed as you see here, where you can tell that there is a kind of flocculent quality to it, while in the lower portion of the field, I think you will notice that there are actually true calcifications present in the background. Another area here showing a giant cell reaction at the periphery and then this kind of granular or grungy blue calcified material that is quite characteristic um, for this tumor. In fact, one of the things in the differential for this is um, uh, Wegner's granulomatosis or as we know, um, granulomatosis with um, vasculitis. This is quite commonly seen in these particular lesions as well, um, but different categories. So I'm just using it as part of the differential. Then when you look at the immunophenotypic expression here, you will notice the FGF23 with a messenger RNA uh, CISH technique highlighting an expression in the nucleus. So it can be a very nice confirmatory study in this particular setting. Well, you know, um, extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma is one of those really annoying tumors because um, it is certainly extraskeletal, so that much I'll give you, but um, it isn't a chondrosarcoma. So unfortunately, though, the name is out there. We are not really sure of the histogenesis of this particular tumor or how it is actually differentiating, but it does show um, a very abundant myxoid matrix, uniform cells, often in cords and clusters that have an associated myxoid background stroma. Interestingly, the N our 4A3 gene rearrangement is either with EWSR1 or with TAF15. And um, that particular fusion um, is kind of diagnostic of this particular entity. As you know, NR4A3 can be seen in other tumors as well. Certainly in the salivary gland, you can see it in the cynic cell carcinoma. So it is not unique to this tumor, but in this particular histologic setting can be quite helpful. Um, within the head and neck space, the orbit and intracranial area is most commonly affected. And then histologically, it's kind of this multi-nodular appearance with broad fibrous connective tissue septa, um, a background of um, myxoid to chondromyxoid matrix, but generally no hyaline type cartilage. And in fact, it can be a remarkably vascular stroma with then a multitude of cells sprinkled throughout, arranged in a variety of different patterns often showing vacuolated cytoplasm. So in fact, a myoepithelial tumor of some sort is usually in the differential for this lesion, and hence the reason um, for including it here in this talk as well. So it can have a very myxoid appearance uh, when you look at it um, macroscopically, as you can see here. Um, no specific immunophenotype. So this is the reason why it is so challenging. Um, it should not have muscle markers, however, and obviously would also not be positive with GFAP, one of the other myoepithelial type markers. And then it's kind of a plus minus reactivity with S100 protein, CD117, synaptophysin, and even NSE. And if you have a rhabdoid type morphology, it is not surprising that there is also a loss of INI1. So when you look at the tumor, you will notice that it does have this lobular architectural arrangement. Um, you can tell that there is this myxoid matrix material present throughout. You can see myxoid material uh, between each of these uh, strands and islands of cells in a reticulated appearance. Another area here showing you a very well-developed uh, myxoid uh, background with these islands of cells also having a very prominent vascularity associated with it. 
Now, as I said, this can be detected um, by doing a rearrangement. And here is um, the fish re uh, rearrangement for EWSR1. Obviously, you cannot tell what the translocation partner is in this particular case with the NR4A3, but just knowing that um, the EWSR1 has been affected can certainly help you with the differential. You know, one of the things that's quite interesting about fish is um, this is a jellyfish I took a photo of at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and it is the gene from the this particular jellyfish as the red chromophore that is used in fish. So I always find that to be a fun fact that jellyfish give us what we use in fish. Now, actually, um, we have something that the soft tissue book does not have. Um, so the GLI-1 altered soft tissue tumors were identified subsequent to the publication of the um, WHO fifth edition soft tissue book. And so this is the only place you will find it. Although recognizing uh, that while about 40% of them occur in the head and neck, obviously they also occur throughout the rest of the body. So it is sort of an uncertain histogenesis neoplasm and it's characterized by this kind of epithelioid morphology and showing GLI-1 alterations. Now, the GLI-1 alterations can be detected by fusions in about two-thirds of the case, while amplifications and sometimes even co-amplifications of neighboring genes can be seen in the remaining third. So interestingly, this tumor will have a protrusion into um, the vessels. It has a wide arch uh, arch architectural appearance as well as cytomorphologic features, sometimes arranged in sheets and fascicles, pseudo rosettes and cords, very small medium uh, cells that are epithelioid to ovoid and spindled, quite monomorphic. So in other words, they all appear kind of similar one to another. And I will say whenever I see that particular pattern, the notion that it is being driven by a particular um, uh, fusion uh, or a single point mutation is often the case. Um, very limited mitotic activity, but you know, usually a very prominent vascularity. And in fact, um, often vascular space invasion is easily identified. So uh, we're using soft tissue tumor at this particular point, recognizing that some of them may in fact um, metastasize. So what's interesting about the immunophenotypic uh, expression of these is that they can be remarkably um, wishy-washy, they can be patchy, they can be weak and focal. And so it is quite challenging to come up with a differential for this particular tumor. Recognize, however, that smooth muscle actin and S100 protein are quite frequently expressed. And ironically, because this tumor develops within the oropharynx quite frequently, there is a strong expression of P16. So unfortunately, if you're looking at a core needle and trying to look at a tumor and you've done a P16 as part of the evaluation, you could be tricked into thinking that this may be part of an oropharyngeal uh, carcinoma, and it is definitely not. Now, what is unique is that um, overexpression of CDK14, MDM2, and STAT6 can be seen much more frequently when there is an amplification of GLI-1 rather than a, a rearrangement. So just recognize that this can be the case. Now, because GLI-1 was not yet recognized easily and you couldn't get um, a panel for it, uh, it is curious that fish for DDIT3 can be a surrogate um, because this is um, uh, immediately adjacent and therefore it is part of that particular um, gene sequence. Therefore, it is something that can be done at least at this particular point if you don't have access to GLI-1 um, as a surrogate. Recognize that GLI-1 fish is for rearrangements and not for amplifications. So with that in mind, here you can see um, vascular space invasion by the neoplastic cells kind of in an organoid appearance or even alveolar architecture, very prominent alveolar architecture in this particular case where you would obviously have paraganglioma within the differential diagnostic consideration. Here you have a bit more of a mixoid background stroma of these spindled to epithelioid cells and here very prominent vascularity with a background of um, mixoid uh, matrix material. Just let me highlight that you can have amplification of GLI-1 or you may have a rearrangement. And with the rearrangement, you're obviously able to detect the rearrangements with the FISH um, probes. But this is something that is still um, in development, but has been incorporated into this new edition of the soft tissue area.
Now, one of the other things that was updated was the adamantinoma like Ewing sarcoma. As you know, the Ewing's family uh, sarcoma is defined by a variety of different fusions of the FET and ETS gene families, but the adamantinoma like is actually one that is much more frequent in the head and neck, salivary glands, and even thyroid. And it has um, a peripheral palisading and sometimes a very well developed squamous differentiation. It is certainly not in every case, but when it is seen, it can sort of trick you into thinking you're dealing with a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. And I will say most of these cases within the salivary gland have been misinterpreted to represent metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. So kind of by definition, you have a nice strong membranous reactivity with CD99. NKX 2.2 is also expressed. And then depending upon which translocation partner may be there, FLY1 or ERG can also be seen in these particular tumors. And then with the adamantinoma like P40 and P63 are also strongly expressed. So here you will notice a, um, a sort of blue round cell tumor category. Tumor necrosis is easily identified. There is a very... Um, uh, block-like uh, chromatin distribution for these tumors, and that is one of the easier tip-offs that you're not dealing with uh, some of the other tumors within the small blue round cell category. Um, higher power demonstrating those same features where there is a kind of coarse nuclear chromatin distribution rather than a neuroendocrine type appearance to it. Um, the kind of characteristic alveolar pattern can be seen even with the adamantinoma like Ewing pattern. And then as you can tell from an immunophenotypic expression uh, perspective, um, I, I usually approach these in a panel because clearly um, there are many things in the differential diagnosis and there is great overlapping between them. And so I do think that the CD99 with the NKX 2.2 is probably one of the most helpful features in confirming the diagnosis of this particular tumor. So here you'll see a strong P40, so you can tell that it is co-expressing um, both myoepithelial, if you will, or in this case, squamous uh, differentiation markers. Same thing would be seen with P63, and of course, CK56 can also be strongly co-expressed with this tumor. But it is this very uh, well-developed membranous CD99 immunoreactivity that is probably the most helpful and defined and of course, since it is a nuclear reaction with NKX 2.2, it certainly helps um, in confirming the diagnosis. I think you may all know that the NKX 2 is the downstream target for EWSR1 Fly1 fusion, and therefore it is actually required as part of the oncogenic transformation. And so this is uh, one of the things that can be done to confirm the diagnosis where the EWSR1 fish can be performed. And yet in this particular case, it does not tell you what the translocation partner is, but certainly can be useful in confirming the diagnostic category. Now, when one considers um, the idea of the hematolymphoid proliferations, um, or neoplasms, there actually have been a number of entities that have not been included before um, that have been added into this particular edition of the book. And again, site-specific lesions um, were kept where they were, but all of the otherwise hematolymphoid proliferations and neoplasms were put into a single book and then divided out by B and T cell, um, as well as um, some other categories. So I think one of the um, nice things is adding in some of the, quote, reactive type lesions. So in other words, the EBV mucocutaneous ulcer, we know is a reactive phenomenon. It um, kind of is induced and then resolves on its own. Same thing with the IgG4 related diseases. Uh, this is the first time that they have been incorporated. And then uh, juvenile xanthogranuloma and Erdheim Chester were also added in based on the features that you see within the head and neck space for these uh, hematolymphoid proliferations. So let's talk about um, the EBV positive mucocutaneous ulcer for a moment. It's a self limiting lymphoproliferative disorder, very, very polymorphic appearance to it, and including um, Hodgkin's like cells, where you can almost have Reed Sternberg like cells involved in it. And in general, it is with someone who has some sort of immunocompromise. Now, of course, that can be a variety of different settings, but the autoimmune and post-transplant setting, and even in the elderly, can certainly be uh, one of the contributing factors. It's usually a very well-defined ulcer, with the base having these um, large lymphoid cells with uh, immunoblasts and even Hodgkin-like cells. And of course, they are going to be positive with EBER. Sometimes they will be positive also with CD30 and sometimes even rarely with CD15. So they really can be um, quite um, 
uh, ominous to uh, look at, but the clinical setting and knowing the information about what's going on with the patient can certainly help you to reach this particular interpretation. Um, the IgG4 related diseases is, of course, again, one of the new introduced lesions in this book where there is a well recognized um, IgG4 rich uh, lymphoplasmacytic population that's usually associated with some sort of storiform fibrosis and obliterative phlebitis, and of course, typically with elevated serum IgG4 levels. And the head and neck space is certainly an area that is quite commonly affected. Submandibular gland, most commonly, in fact, it used to be called Kuttner tumor if you use the old terminology, although of course we uh, prefer that that is not the case at this particular time. So as you know, it's kind of a aggregation of these findings, the obliterative phobitis, storiform fibrosis, and the very rich uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate in which the IgG4 positive cells um, are seen in a ratio of greater than 40% or in fact, more than 400 per square millimeter. So I, I will say that um, there are uh, additional diseases that can have IgG4 positive um, plasma cells in it. You need to have the entire component of the histology in order to place it in this particular lesion. So as an example, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor can certainly have IgG4 positive cells in it, but you're not going to have the ratio of the IgG4 to IgG, and you won't have um, the obliterative phlebitis. So it is something that you need to recognize as a response. And in fact, sometimes given the complexity of the diagnostic criteria, um, steroid treatment or even rituximab may be utilized first in order to confirm what's going on with the diagnosis. So a consistent with or suggestive of diagnosis may lead to clinical management of these patients anyway. So um, I will say that because this is the first book that came out, in other words, the HEME book came out just after this, and therefore um, it is incorporated into the HEME book as well. But since this was the first representation of it in the series, we decided to put down the criteria for all of the anatomic sites. I'm only highlighting this particular table for the affected sites of the head and neck, where we're including the orbital lacrimal glands, and then of course, um, salivary glands as a uh, solidinitis condition. But recognize that all of them for the entire body, including pancreas and other organs, have been incorporated as well. And then the both clinical features are listed, as well as the specific um, ITG uh, four counts that are required. So I think it's a very nice uh, tabular form of being able to recognize what all of the criteria are as you move about the, the body. So here is an example of that, you know, very storiform fibrosis. You can see that it's creating kind of a lobular architecture. There's still a rich um, inflammatory infiltrate. Germinal centers are even visible in several of the spaces. Here is another example where you can see that there is a rich um, plasmacytoid um, and lymphoplasmacytic uh, infiltrate into the gland. Uh, recognize that this can occur in other sites as well. This happens to be an example of IgG4 disease affecting the sinonasal tract. So you can see that there is a uh, nice area of respiratory type mucosa overlying the proliferation below. So just know that while we think of it in salivary glands and the orbit, it certainly can occur anywhere within the head and neck space. Now, it's really nice when you see the obliterative phlebitis. Uh, here you can see a vessel that is completely destroyed by the inflammatory infiltrate. And in fact, the uh, elastic layer is being destroyed as well. But I will say that this is quite difficult to see. And uh, reticulin stains or elastic stains can often be used to highlight this particular feature. But just know that in the head and neck specifically, the obliterative phlebitis is often um, not seen in every one of the cases. And then, of course, with the very rich inflammatory infiltrate, this definitely should be easily identified with lots of plasma cells and lymphocytes. And then when performing the IgG and IgG4, you can see that there's almost a one-to-one -one ratio in this particular case. And clearly, it would be much more than the 40% um, IgG4 to IgG ratio. And given the number of cells in that particular single high power field, you can tell that you would get to more than 400 in a square millimeter for sure. So just recognize this disease has now been incorporated. It is not a neoplasm, right? So many of the entities that have been included in the book are included because they present clinically as a mass type lesion, which can be confused clinically with neoplasia. And so we thought that the IgG4 category would be one of those entities to incorporate um, at this time. The large cell, uh, large B cell lymphoma with I, um, 
uh, RF4 rearrangement um, is recognized specifically by that particular category. As you know, it's a tumor that affects the pediatric age group. And by far and away, the most common presentation for this tumor is within Waldire's ring. And therefore, it was really felt that it needed to be presented in this case. Um, often a very centroblastic type morphology with um, a nice blastic uh, type appearance of intermediate sized cells. Interestingly, mitoses are not that common and usual, usually the tangible body macrophages are not seen. And as you would expect, um, you need to have IRF4 positive uh, as a immuno expression. And then of course, um, doing the rearrangement by fish would help recognizing that um, there's often um, other uh, uh, findings that can be helpful when they are absent as well. So there's an absence of BCL2 and MIC gene rearrangements in this particular large B-cell lymphoma category. So here you will notice um, very large blastic type cells um, in this particular field. Um, uh, when you go on high power, you can see that they really are remarkably atypical. Um, here I'm demonstrating there are actually some mitotic figures, but just know that they are usually not greatly increased. And then, of course, a wide spectrum of immunophenotype with the BCL6 and MUM1 uh, being positive in this particular case as well. Now, juvenile xanthogranuloma um, is a clonal um, proliferation, so hence it is included as one of the neoplastic categories, but it is of non-Langerhans cell histiocytes, um, definitely associated with a very good outcome, although there are some very uncommon cases that will have a systemic manifestation. So within the head and neck, um, the skin is probably the most common presentation, often in young children as well, and of course it's these characteristic Teuton type giant cells that are the most uh, frequently identified. And as you will see, a variety of histocytic markers, including CD68 and CD163, would be positive, while Longerin, CD207, and CD1A are negative, um, helping to exclude Longerin cell histiocytosis. Now, Erdheim Chester was also included in this um, book. It is a xanthelasma like lesion around the eyes and face, and it is a um, histocytic neoplasm. Um, often of mature histiocytes with background fibrosis and in fact involving multiple different organs. So in general, we think of it um, in the head and neck as presenting around the eyes and face, but just recognize that it can occur in a variety of other locations as well, and quite commonly is associated with some sort of underlying hematopoietic uh, or myeloid neoplasm, most commonly with CMML. So the neoplastic cells, again, are going to be positive with histiocytic markers. Here you can see CD163 and CD68. But I'm going to talk a bit about the molecular findings for this disease in a moment. But I also want to highlight that, again, even though this is being presented within the head and neck space, um, we selected and opted to have a number of different tabular formats to show what other organs may be involved and what the clinical and or histologic presentations would be. And so here you will notice that things about the bone and retroperitoneum, heart, endocrine system, respiratory system are all being included in this particular uh, table to be able to help you um, maybe alert clinicians to where else they need to examine the patient to find out if there is concurrent disease there. Now, again, this is one of those diseases where, um, you know, BRAF mutation is seen. And here you can see the BRAF V600E is seen in nearly 50% of the cases. But then there are also um, not just single point mutations, but actually fusions of BRAF. So if you notice here in the upper corner, you'll notice that about 2% of them uh, are associated with BRAF fusions. And there are a variety of others. So this is another example where you can see that even though there is a um, driver for this disorder from a genetic perspective. It is not just a single um, mutation. There are multiple different mutations that can be seen. And so, of course, um, the histiocytes are quite characteristic. And of course, again, CD163 uh, can be positive in these tumors. So just highlighting um, the new lesions that have been incorporated. I'm not going all of the uh, other uh, general category within the hematolymphoid lesion, where the uh, B cell lymphomas have still been included, as well as the NKT cell group. So let's now go to melanocytic lesions. And it's always nice when you just go down to one, right? So <laughs> in other words, we have... Um, 
slowly uh, decrease this to ultimately ending up with just mucosal melanoma as the final category. So if you think about mucosal melanoma, junctional activity or pagetoid spread is probably one of the most helpful findings to uh, confirm primary disease, uh, recognizing that most of them, of course, involve the stroma. But if you're trying to decide whether it represents a metastasis to the head and neck or if it's arising primarily in that location, uh, junctional activity is certainly quite helpful. Now, I will say that sometimes you can have pagetoid spread into the space, but uh, just know that by far and away, the vast majority um, are junctional activity of, for a primary lesion. I will just give you a caveat, and that is in my 30 years of experience with sinonasal oral cavity and laryngeal, um, even nasopharyngeal melanoma, um, I have yet to see a case of metastatic disease from a cutaneous primary. Now, they may invade directly through. So in other words, if you have one on your nose and it invades into the nasal cavity, clearly that's going to be a different scenario. But um, just by far and away, if you have a uh, melanoma arising within that space, the chance is that it's going to be primary rather than metastatic. Now, as we all know, there's a wide diversity of histologic appearances to this, and we use the term protean. As you know, Proteus was the god of change and could present in multiple different forms, and that's exactly what melanoma does. And so I thought I would put in that illustration from the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. So a variety of different patterns, right? That's exactly what you would expect in a variety of different cytologies. So here, let me just highlight that you can see pagetoid spread here in the overlying surface respiratory epithelium of the neoplastic melanocytic cells. You'll notice that there is some pigment present in the cytoplasm of the neoplastic cells in the underlying stroma. An example like this, where you have a remarkably pleomorphic cell in a metaplastic squamous epithelium from the nasal cavity, you can tell that this is an example of junctional activity before it drops off into the underlying stroma. You can also have spindle cell architecture for these tumors. You can have a blue round cell appearance for these tumors. So they have a variety of different uh, cytological appearances. And this is an important thing to remember when dealing with melanoma. One of the unique characteristics is the fact that it does have a nice paratheliomatous uh, distribution. In other words, it wraps around vessels. This is usually related to maintain maintenance of blood supply. But still, this particular feature, whenever I see it, especially in kind of a blue round cell tumor pattern, makes me think of uh, mucosal melanoma. Now, as you know, a variety of different uh, immunohistochemical studies can be performed. I think that in general, we use uh, at least one or two stains rather than just using one. Um, SOX10 and HMB45 are probably the ones that are uh, the most helpful in this particular setting. But, you know, SOX10, S100, HMB45, tyrosinase, and even melan -A. Of course, PRAME was introduced as being preferentially expressed antigen in melanoma. But as we know, this is just a, a marker that can be seen in a variety variety of different tumors as well, and is in fact not specific for melanoma at all. But if you have a neoplasm in which you are struggling and PRAME is positive, at least um, you may think about um, mucosal melanoma as being one of the tumors. Um, recognize that it can also be seen in a variety of others. Now, one of the things that is important to recognize as well is the um, a genetic landscape for mucosal melanoma. Those that develop within the head and neck space are much more frequently associated with NRAS or KIT mutations or amplifications rather than BRAF. So in fact, if you have a melanoma and you diagnose it as such, Sometimes the clinicians will say, well, can you do a BRAF? Because of course they have uh, therapies that can be directed against it. And this is where you may need to say, just one second, you know, this is a mucosal melanoma. The chance it's gonna be BRAF associated is much less likely. In fact, it's around 10% or so of cases. So it's a much more um, discussion-based uh, interpretation rather than just getting it automatically when you have metastatic disease as you would perhaps for a sentinel lymph node being positive for melanoma in uh, the cutaneous sites. So just something to discuss with your clinicians when you look at it. As you would expect, you have a wide variety of different architectural patterns and cytologic appearances. Here is a, a number of different markers. You can see the SOX10 staining a, a round cell pattern, the S100 in a spindle cell, while the HMB45 is also seen in a spindle cell population, melan A in a polygonal appearance. And you know, I'm including frame just because it is a nice marker with the nuclear reactivity. This happened to be in a spindle cell melanoma. Let's now transition to the lesions of the neck. 
And um, it's interesting that we did not include the neck at all in the 2005. It just, you know, wasn't there. Um, then we added it in in 2017 and have now updated it um, for this particular location as well. So the new entities are lymphoepithelial cyst and branchioma. And of course, uh, moving Merkel cell carcinoma to the neuroendocrine neoplasm category, because of course it can present um, in the skin of the head and neck, but often it is metastatic disease to the lymph nodes as well. And so it had been included uh, in this location previously, but now it's much more logically presented in the neuroendocrine neoplasm uh, part of the book. So uh, branchioma is the uh, benign neoplasm that is a mixture of spindle cells, epithelial islands, and adipocytes, usually affecting a very specific anatomic site within the supraclavicular area. Uh, previously, ectopic hamartomatous thymoma or even branchial anglog mixed tumor were used as names for this. But as you know, um, it is not a thymoma. There's nothing about it that is um, thymoma. And of course, you know, it isn't really ectopic in that sense either. So, um, and it's not a hamartoma, it's a neoplasm. So it seemed that all of the previous nomenclature for this were incorrect. And so branchioma is um, the now preferred terminology for this entity. Uh, it is a haphazard proliferation of these spindle cells. Um, non-keratinizing squamoid islands and anastomosing cords and glandular structures can be seen. And all of this is kind of in a lattice-like to storiform fascicular architecture, sometimes with fat cells haphazardly presented. Um, just recognize that sometimes you can have a carcinoma develop within these lesions as well. It doesn't seem to adversely affect the overall outcome of these patients, at least thus far. So here you will notice a radiographic presentation in the low anterior neck right in front of the larynx at the the uh, area of the sternocleidoid, uh, stern, excuse me, of the clavicle to manubrial joint right at the sternocleidomastoid muscle insertion. And then, uh, you know, here is a very well circumscribed uh, low power. You can tell the large epithelial islands, um, adipose tissue is easily identified, and then these kind of spindled uh, areas that are quite easily uh, noted throughout. So here are the spindle cells. You can notice that they are also these epithelioid islands between, as well as areas of squamous uh, nests with kind of keratin debris in the center and abundant um, adipose tissue. These spindle cells are quite characteristically seen throughout and uh, are very helpful. They have kind of a myoid phenotype, and you can tell that uh, these are what would be positive for the my myoepithelial marker category. So a unique entity within this particular space of the head and neck. I will add a couple of cases have been reported in the mid-axial line, probably embryological development-based uh, abnormality resulting in their appearance in that location. So the germ cell tumors, well, you know, um, they were not, as you can tell, they were not included at all in 2017. Now we've added them back in and just recognize that, you know, this covers the entire teratoma category. Uh, there's nothing interesting or different about teratomas per se in the head and neck. And then, of course, yolk sac tumors and germ cell uh, tumor is the most common, uh, but other ones can be seen as well. Um, specifically, though, uh, the smart b one deficient carcinomas within the sinonasal tract and, of course, teratocarcinosarcoma are not considered to be germ cell neoplasia. So I'm just highlighting that uh, those particular tumors are separate entities within the head and neck at this space. Um, probably the most important thing with any of the germ cell tumors is to recognize that they are extra gonadal. So in other words, that they are not metastatic from another site. Um, I have certainly seen lesions from the mediastinum present within the head and neck space. So it is important to have um, a full evaluation of the patient to exclude the possibility of metastatic disease first. So speaking of metastasis, here they are. Um, they were not included in the 2017, but we have now added them back in as a single chapter. So within the single chapter, as you can think about the head and neck, lots of metastatic disease occurs in this location. Uh, they are either through lymphatics or vascular channels, and they must be non-contiguous in this location. So hematolymphoid lesions, by definition, are also excluded. So each of the anatomic sites um, of you know, oral cavity and sinonasal tract and temporal bone, maxillofacial facial bones, etc., are highlighted for whatever the particular anatomics, uh, whatever the uh, disease is for that particular metastatic uh, 
tumor type. So if you think about um, this again, presenting in kind of a tabular form, it's a very nice and comprehensive table that was developed for this particular uh, chapter where you can see, let, let's just choose oral cavity. So you can tell that, you know, there are a number of different um, epithelial as well as mesenchymal neoplasms and melanoma that can uh, metastasize to these locations. And here would be an approach to how you would be able to separate these tumors from primary lesions as they occur here. So it's a nice way of looking at um, all of the various anatomic sites. The table goes on forever. I'm gonna include it here now. I just left it on for a few moments so you'd be able to see it, but just recognize that all of these particular sites have um, nice tabular representation. And then the text also incorporates several of the clinical and epidemiological factors that go into the evaluation of metastatic disease to the head and neck. As you all know, um, you know, the tumors can have a specific morphology. However, if I were to show you the left-hand panel, you may say, well, that just looks like adenocarcinoma. And um, unless you were to do additional markers to be able to confirm it, uh, you wouldn't necessarily recognize that it's prostate carcinoma positive with NKX 3.1 in this case. So uh, past medical history, past clinical history is going to be helpful in evaluating these tumors. Although quite often they don't have the appearance of primary lesions. In other words, they don't match what you usually see in the anatomic site in which they are um, being presented. So here is an example of a metastatic renal cell carcinoma, has a slightly oncocytic appearance to it, but it doesn't look like any primary head and neck based tumor. And so in this example here, you can see a nice positivity with PAX8. It was also positive with renal cell marker, helping to confirm that this is a metastatic focus. So I think that the most um, significant um, update and change occurred within the neuroendocrine neoplasia category. And this is across the board for the entire fifth series, where there has been a major emphasis on trying to harmonize the terminology for neuroendocrine neoplasms and paraganglioma throughout. And so for the neuroendocrine tumor category, they are all now defined as grade one, two, and three. Although site-specific criteria have not yet been developed specific for uh, each of the anatomic sites within the head and neck, um, but it was felt that we all recognize neuroendocrine neoplasms in these locations and now just need to be more strict about how we apply the criteria. And then the same thing for neuroendocrine carcinomas, recognizing small and large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas, of course, Merkel cell carcinoma, and there are some mixed epithelial and neuroendocrine carcinoma categories or MENETs. They um, are also included, but you know it is a relatively small uh, number of cases in the head and neck. And so the major focus is on the entire neuroendocrine neoplasia category, trying to harmonize the terminology. So for a neuroendocrine tumor, they are arising from the dispersed neuroendocrine system. Quite frequently, uh, functional imaging studies can help in the localization of these tumors, as well as in the staging or follow-up. And it is uncommon for these tumors within the head and neck to have hormone excess. So unlike the gastrointestinal tract, where they are uh, filtered through the liver, that is not necessarily the case here. And therefore, uh, quite commonly, there is not an excess hormone uh, uh, presentation for these lesions. Uh, here you can see an imaging study. You will notice um, that a, a multifocal disease is present in the left-hand image, whereas in the uh, coronal of a different patient, you can see that there's widespread metastatic disease throughout this particular patient, um, even though uh, it was presenting initially within the head and neck space. So as you know, neuroendocrine tumor as a category is a well-differentiated uh, epithelial neoplasm that's arranged in cords and trabecular or small nests showing neuroendocrine type cells where there is uh, ample cytoplasm and a very characteristic and typical salt and pepper type nuclear chromatin appearance. So for a neuroendocrine tumor, you need to have neuroendocrine features histologically and then at this particular juncture, the same criteria that have been utilized in other anatomic sites like the gastrointestinal system or the uh, pulmonary system, uh, less than two mites per two square millimeters, two to 10 and greater than 10 are helping to define net uh, grade one, two, and three respectively. The uh, key 67 proliferation indices have not yet been optimized for these particular tumors, but just recognize that um, in general, the grade three 
uh, NECs and neuroendocrine carcinomas or NECs are going to be uh, showing a proliferation index usually of greater than 20%. Often it is 70, 80 or 90%, but just recognize that at this particular time, specific cutoffs of the key 67 proliferation index have not yet been identified. Now, as you would expect for neuroendocrine tumors, you need to have epithelial markers of at least one sort. So usually uh, CAM 5.2 is actually one of the most helpful but a pan cytokeratin, OSCAR, or even CK7 can be used. And then a variety of different um, uh, uh, neuroendocrine markers, such as synaptophysin or chromogranin, the transcription factors more recently, like INSM1. And of course, there can be aberrant expression with other markers as well, like calcitonin or TTF1. Now, there is still, for the neuroendocrine tumor category, an intact P53 and an intact retinoblastoma. Those are lost when you get to the carcinoma category. And so in some instances, especially when you're dealing with net uh, grade two or three, uh, performing the retinoblastoma can be quite helpful, along with the, the key 67 to kind of get a better idea of what the tumor type is that you're dealing with. So I think all of us recognize the low-grade category, you know, the kind of uh, very nice rosette appearance to it, fine, delicate nuclear chromatin distribution. Another example here, in fact, it almost looks a little bit like a nested appearance of a paraganglioma in this laryngeal net grade one. However, here you now get into a net grade two where there's a little bit more pleomorphism, a bit more glandularity, and of course, an increase in mitotic index. In fact, if you now look at the degree of cytologic um, atypia, it has also begun to um, be increased. And then finally, when you get into the net uh, grade three, you will notice that there are a myriad of mitotic figures just in the single high power field. And so clearly the cutoff of greater than 10 in uh, two square millimeters is definitely going to be met, uh, in this case also having areas of carmidonecrosis. Another example, just highlighting a variety of different um, mitotic figures present in this very high power field, and in fact, four in just a single field um, with prominent nucleoli easily identified in this laryngeal uh, net. So let me just clarify that previously, this particular tumor would have been called a neuroendocrine carcinoma um, uh, poorly differentiated. However, as we now have expanded the neuroendocrine neoplasm category, if the retinoblastoma is intact, this particular tumor is going to be referred to as a neuroendocrine tumor grade three. It can metastasize, it can present with disease in the neck, but just like its gastrointestinal or lung counterparts, the actual uh, biologic behavior of the nets can sometimes be equivalent to what you see with neuroendocrine carcinoma, and yet it is still a different category. So as you notice, prominent uh, reactivity with the pan-cytokeratin, chromogranin will be nicely positive in the cells, sometimes even in this granular type appearance, while synaptophysin gives you a much more uh, diffuse cytoplasmic reactivity pattern. I already mentioned that you can have co-expression of other markers, so the laryngeal cases especially can have uh, reactivity with um, calcitonin. And so here you can see a very nice strong and diffuse reaction with calcitonin. In fact, you can even see TTF1 positive in these particular neoplasms, and it does not indicate that they have been uh, metastasized from a pulmonary primary. And then, as I already mentioned, retinoblastoma should be intact within the neuroendocrine tumor category, no matter what the grade. So grade one, two, and three neuroendocrine tumors all should have an intact retinoblastoma. Now, let's transition to the small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma category. As you know, it's considered to be a high-grade tumor by definition, uh, with epithelioid cells having scant cytoplasm, often uh, hyperchromatic nuclei, inconspicuous nucleoli, uh, lots of tumor necrosis, um, uh, artifactual crushing, uh, cannibalization uh, of the cells, molding between the cells. So they are the classic appearance that you see for pulmonary lesions as well. And as you know, about 60% of them occur within the larynx. The uh, next major site is the sinonasal tract, but just recognize that there are some overlaps with these particular tumors and other lesions as well. Um, Specifically for the larynx, there is a strong association with tobacco use, but also recognize when you're in the oropharynx and you have a neuroendocrine carcinoma, there may still be a strong association with high risk um, HPV being present as well. Uh, of course, the smoking history may also be commonly co-identified. 
So again, the number one thing to recognize with all of the neuroendocrine tumor, uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma classification is that you must have neuroendocrine features predominating histologically. This is not a category where because you have immunophenotypic expression in a few cells for one of the neuroendocrine markers that you move it into this category. It needs to have a predominant histologic appearance with neuroendocrine features. So in general, for small cell carcinoma, sheets and nests, peripheral palisading or rosettes, the cells are usually about the size of three lymphocytes. So we call them small cells, but actually they, they are not. Um, but just recognize that that's generally the diameter that we like to use of three lymphocytes. Very little in the way of cytoplasm. Mitotic count is usually incredibly high. Lots of apoptosis and um, necrosis. The azapardi effect can be seen. And, you know, sometimes you may have um, another tumor present as well, such as the squamous cell carcinoma in combination. So here you will notice a lobular architectural arrangement, very rich fibrovascular stroma, um, small blue round cell appearance to them where they have molded one to another, but you can tell that very nice salt and pepper type nuclear chromatin distribution and, you know, many, many mitotic figures and apoptotic figures present in this field. Here you have that nuclear molding or crush artifact. So in fact, when I see that, it's helpful to me that I'm dealing with a small cell carcinoma category. Here you have this very fine, even stippled nuclear chromatin and distribution with very inconspicuous to small nucleoli um, in cells uh, that have a very high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Now, as I've already suggested, um, the again CAM 5.2 or other epithelial markers will be present, as well as neuroendocrine markers with abnormal now P53 and global loss of retinoblastoma. So just recognize that the global loss of retinoblastoma is probably one of the most helpful features in coming up with the diagnosis here. Again, not well established for uh, cutoffs for the key 67 proliferation index, but by far and away, the majority have a very high index no matter what. So many times you will see a dot-like immunoreactivity pattern with the keratin. So in other words, there's a Golgi-like accentuation of the uh, immuno uh, uh, deposition. And this is a helpful finding. In fact, we all recognize this already with Merkel cell carcinoma, which is a neuroendocrine carcinoma category as well, although separate from the small cell category, but just knowing that it has the same type of uh, Golgi representation. It should not have reactivity with P40 as epithelial markers and will also be negative with CK56. I'm just highlighting this to show that it definitely is not part of the squamous cell carcinoma category. And then, of course, synaptophysin will be positive or chromogranin and then INSM1 as an example of one of the more recent um, specific um, transcription factor markers. Now, um, I've mentioned the loss of retinoblastoma. As you know, it is constitutively expressed in the rest of the uh, background stromal component. So you do have a nice, strong internal control that allows you to make an interpretation easily, where you can see that all of the neoplastic cells, even though they are crushed, and even though they have molding against one another, they still have lost this particular uh, retinoblastoma and therefore can be quite helpful in confirming the diagnosis. Um, very, very uh, high key 67s, I think in this case, you know, you'd all agree with me, it's greater than 70%. So just recognize it's a usually a very, very mitotically active uh, neoplastic proliferation. Now, one of the things, especially when it is in the oropharynx, uh, there may be a um, association with HPV, and therefore you're going to have um, transcriptionally active high-risk HPV that can be in detected by a variety of different techniques. This one happening to be an RNA in situ hybridization, but in the specific anatomic site, um, the uh, high-risk HPV needs to be performed because P16 can be overexpressed due to other pathway abnormalities. So if you look at lung uh, small cell carcinoma, they're going to have P16 immunoreactivity and of course are not related to HPV. So it is important when you're in the head and neck to recognize that fact and do additional testing uh, by another method in order to be able to confirm that it is transcriptionally active. Now, the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma category um, is one that we also recognize, larynx, oropharynx, and sinonasal tract, but just recognize that at this particular point, especially in the uh, sinonasal tract, IDH2 mutations can be seen, and um, when you have a smart a 4 loss, by definition at this particular point, we're still including it within this recent complex deficient sinonasal carcinoma category, rather than under the neuroendocrine tumor category or neuroendocrine carcinoma category. So I will say that 
that the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma category, specifically within the upper aerodigestive tract area, does have some room for additional teasing out potentially of other entities that may be incorporated into this. And so the IDH2 and um, Suisenif complex group needs to at least be considered. Well, you know, the large cell is very similar to large cell anywhere else, very prominent nucleoli. Um, of course, the neuroendocrine chromatin distribution is quite easily identified here with um, strong reactivity with CAM 5.2, a very, very nice epithelial marker for neuroendocrine uh, tumors and one that I prefer to see. And then, of course, here is a nice positive reaction with INSM1. Now, of course, a discussion uh, of the head and neck would not be complete without including um, the pituitary neuroendocrine tumor category or PITNET. Um, as you know, uh, the sinonasal tract um, is going to be a location for this particular tumor and specifically the sphenoid sinus. So when I look at the uh, sphenoid sinus here, you can tell the pituitary is immediately above it. Of course, when you look at it on a different plane, you'll notice the same thing. So a tumor arising in that location invariably tends to be one that has direct extension from the cella rather than being ectopic, but still ectopic tumors can certainly be seen. And it is important to recognize when a tumor is growing down into the space versus being uh, completely separate from it. So here is an example where both of these tumors were sampled from the sinonasal tract or from the nasopharynx specifically. And yet, um, because it's being sampled by a head and neck surgeon, uh, the diagnosis of a pituitary uh, neuroendocrine tumor is not necessarily the first thing in your head. So it can have um, a very nice uh, reverse polarization away from the vessels, giving you this nice kind of pseudo rosetted appearance, although you can have rosettes. You will notice that there is bone destruction, right? Because it's growing down through the sphenoid uh, sinus uh, bone and to present in the sphenoid sinus and therefore bone involvement can certainly be seen. Uh, it is also important to recognize that tumor necrosis can be seen and this still does not change the underlying tumor category. I will say that one of the most difficult categories to recognize is when there is a very strong desmoplastic stromal reaction. And so here, each of these small little islands is the actual neoplastic proliferation being compressed between fibrous connective tissue. And the number of times that this is interpreted to actually be just part of a chronic rhinosinusitis before the diagnosis is actually rendered. I think we all recognize uh, the nice pattern here with neuroendocrine type appearance. Um, to the neoplastic cells, even a nice uh, rosetted appearance in the center. Sometimes profound pleomorphism can be seen, and this still does not detract from the underlying diagnosis of a pituitary neuroendocrine tumor. Now, as you know, the profile can be quite um, remarkable as well. As you know, with the new uh, CNS book that has come out uh, as well, they are all divided out by the particular transcription factor with PIT1, SF1, and TPIT, the major three families for separating out the various tumors. And so these need to be done in order to be able to recognize which category they fit in. So here is an example of um, PIT1. It's a very nice, strong nuclear reaction. Recognize that a variety of different epithelial and neuroendocrine markers can be seen within this particular tumor category. And their pituitary hormones are also going to be recognized um, with prolactin probably uh, seen most frequently, although a variety of them can be seen often co-expressed uh, with both the, the neuroendocrine marker and epithelial marker category. So just ending that particular concept with the prolactin to show that it is a very nice, strong and diffuse reaction. And as you know, the pituitary neuroendocrine tumor category is very specific for uh, being graded as well. So the grading of um, PITNET grade one, two, and three, um, allowing for a tumor that potentially has metastasized, you haven't called it a pituitary adenoma. Because to say it's a pituitary adenoma and then it metastasizes is really difficult for the patients to get around. Whereas if you call it a pituitary neuroendocrine tumor and metastasis develops, it's a different um, thing and a different classification for these lesions. So this is also ongoing. The new CNS book has incorporated both PITNET and pituitary adenoma concurrently as um, accepted terminology with PITNET being the preferred term at this point. Well, uh, paraganglioma, of course, also occur within the head and neck area, so I won't, um, you know, leave those out by any stretch, uh, recognized uh, by a variety of different um, uh, various radionucleotide studies, and so the somatostatin uh, receptor avidity with PET-CT combination with dotatate is very, very helpful, and uh, this is something that can be done quite easily by your um, radiology group.
It is one of the most commonly inherited tumors, however, and so germline mutations um, specifically within the uh, succinate dehydrogenase family, whether it's D, B, C, or A can certainly be recognized, while those in uh, von Heppel, Lindau, RET, or NF1 uh, can be seen as well. So as you would expect, the SDHB immunohistochemistry or other sort of relevant genetic testing is really recommended in this instance to be able to help um, the families be placed in the correct um, genetic syndrome classification group and to be able to manage um, siblings, parents, relatives, etc. So here is an example of bilateral disease that's much more frequently seen within syndrome association. You can see a, um, a, a magnetic resonance um, angiography being performed for an SDHD patient. And then of course, doing uh, various uh, radionucleotide studies can also help to identify when multifocal disease is present in these patients. Quite commonly within the head and neck space, uh, patients have had some sort of embolic therapy prior. This is to decrease the amount of bleeding. This particular therapeutic option is not used anywhere else in the body. So in fact, whenever I see um, an embolic uh, lesion within the head and neck, neck or ear and temporal bone, I always think, oh, they must have thought this was a paraganglioma. And so at least I need to consider that as one of the uh, diagnostic uh, considerations as I evaluate the tumor. So the classic appearance, I think all of us recognize the Zellbahn and architecture, the kind of mild uh, pleomorphism that can be seen with a supporting sustentacular framework around it. That framework can be highlighted with an S100 protein, recognizing that sometimes it is lost in those tumors that behave in a more biologically aggressive manner and risk stratification protocols are utilized for paraganglioma slash pheochromocytoma throughout the body. As you know, tyrosine hydroxylase can be used as one of the markers that is much more specific for paraganglioma and pheochromocytoma cells. And so if you're struggling with the case, this can be used, although it's not widely um, available. It is seen in some commercial labs, but just know that it is not always um, present. And then, of course, the somatostatin receptor 2A is strongly positive. GATA3 can be seen within paraganglioma as well. So some of these other markers can be utilized as you evaluate um, these tumors. And just an example of loss of the um, SDHB immunohistochemistry, you will notice the neoplastic cells are not staining while um, the rest of the stromal component is because it is um, constitutively expressed as well, just like retinoblastoma that I was talking about a few moments ago. But it's a very granular quality in the cytoplasm. So whenever I have an immunohistochemistry that I'm going to interpret as a positive result, when it is a non-reactive or negative immunohistochemistry, I do like to have a nice internal control to make sure that the stain has in fact worked. Okay, so we finally get to the genetic tumor syndromes. I'm definitely not going to go over all of them because this is a brand new chapter, right? Um, 15 different diagnoses have been incorporated into this. And the reason for this is the familial inherited tumor syndromes um, are things that specifically have a major head and neck manifestation is why they were incorporated here. Now, all of the genetic tumor syndromes have been included in their own particular book. And that book is also now available as a beta version online and will be published next year. But I think one of the things that is really super nice is there was an overall standardization of how this was going to be approached. So you had the syndrome name, with either autosomal dominant or recessive, and then caused by constitutively pathogenic variants affecting whichever the gene name, as well as where the gene was located and or specific findings, and then characterized by the major features as follows. So for instance, nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, autosomal dominant tumor syndrome, constitutively pathogenic variants of patch one or SUFU, sometimes uh, GPCR1, and then associated with developmental disorders and predisposition to benign and malignant tumors. So you will notice that that particular phraseology is going to be used for all of them throughout the body. They have been divided out by specific pathways that are affected when you go to the book. So that helps to give a better uh, overall approach to this. The MIM, one, the MIM numbers have been standardized throughout as well. So you will see the MIM 
number used uh, throughout, and then a attempt to try and harmonize incidence related information of per 100,000, no matter what. So for example, with the uh, nevoid basal cell carcinoma, 0.6 per 100,000 population. I mean, this happens to be the data for Australia. They are given for a number of different countries within the book. So having started with that, let me just say, you know, nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome uh, is the one that I'm highlighting here um, as a autosomal dominant disease. You have selection criteria based on the major and minor criteria with um, two major and one minor or one major and three minor being uh, utilized to be able to confirm the diagnosis. As you know, multiple areas of basal cell carcinoma presenting in a young patient. Sometimes pits are identified within the skin of the palms or the feet. Um, having medulloblastoma, of course, and calcification of the false cerebri. And then, of course, for the head and neck, uh, multiple odontogenic keratocysts. Here you can see a representation of multiple cysts affecting the patient radiographically. And, of course, the histology being presented over here, sometimes showing daughter cysts present below the surface, which is one of the tip-offs that you're dealing with this particular diagnostic um, category or entity. So um, with that, I would like to end the presentation and uh, I'm more than happy to try and answer some questions at this particular point, although I know that that was a, another hour-long marathon and appreciate you listening this morning. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, for this excellent uh, talk on, on continuing to update on the WHO classification. There are a few questions online that I can see. Let me read them for you. And majority of them are related to the neuroendocrine tumors. The first question <laughs> is, uh, any difference of intensity and proportion of synaptophysin or other neuroendocrine IAC markers in relation to grades of NEC? Um, so that's an interesting question. First of all, um, I don't think that synaptophysin is as good as chromogranin. So in other words, synaptophysin can be co-expressed in a variety of other uh, neoplasms that are not neuroendocrine tumors. And so if I'm going to have a preference, chromogranin is what I would utilize. Um, obviously, INSM1 and some of the other more specific markers are helpful as well. But synaptophysin tends to be um, expressed in a number of lesions. I will say that the higher the grade of the neuroendocrine tumor, the decrease in immuno uh, intensity can be seen, but I wouldn't necessarily utilize that as a way in which to grade tumors as a surrogate. Uh, I would not do that. Um, uh, again, I, I do think that chromogranin is a little bit easier to interpret uh, than synaptophysin, and I would use that preferentially in evaluating neuroendocrine type tumors. Thank you. There is another related question. Uh, can you make the differential diagnosis between G3, NET, and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma without RB1 staining? Um, yes, I would try to do so. Um, I will say that uh, the amount of uh, prominence to the nucleolus in the neuroendocrine carcinoma category is usually one of the tip offs. And of course, the large cell neuroendocrine tumor is much larger than the size of three lymphocytes. So just the size of the cells alone should help you with that particular separation. Although having said that, I know that many times neuroendocrine tumors are sampled by core needle and um, often the amount of neoplastic population is quite limited. And so being able to make that assessment in general can be a bit challenging. But I do feel that uh, neuroendocrine tumors tend to have a much smaller nucleus than neuroendocrine carcinomas. And of course, um, they do tend to have um, inconspicuous to absent nucleoli for the neuroendocrine tumor category, whereas not for the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. All right, thank you. And here is another one. So is there a difference between net G3 and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma? Probably you answered that already. Yeah, you know, I think from a biological perspective as well, you know, it's usually... Uh, the neuroendocrine carcinoma category is much more likely to present with widely disseminated disease, whereas the nets can have metastasis, but they don't have it to the same degree. Now, having said that, the literature on this topic within the head and neck space is incredibly difficult to interpret at this time. Uh, the reason for that is just nomenclature, right? So if you look at the larynx alone, the larynx has undergone uh, so many different name changes over the years, with um, 
a net grade one was called uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma grade one. I mean, that, that was what it was used in the 2005 classification. So, you know, for me now to say, oh, no, no, that's not a neuroendocrine carcinoma, that's a net grade one, and a net grade one is nothing like a small cell or large cell carcinoma. So now we need to completely revamp all of the old literature, reinterpret it with a very critical eye, and then come up with how we're going to classify these particular tumors moving forward. So as I said, it is a major, major change in this book and I will say that not every single one of the classification categories has a well-defined uh, cutoff points for any of the criteria at this point. So it's a great area for people to do additional research, perhaps even going back to cases that were previously reported and now trying to harmonize them with the new terminology. Uh, that's a great point, Dr. Thompson. And like for GI and pancreas, uh, um, New large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma is within the classification of neuroendocrine neoplasms, whereas I think you mentioned that in the head and neck area, so this is not considered within the realm of the neuroendocrine neoplasms. Is that correct? So, um, no, there is a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma category. However, mm -hmm. if I look at um, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, right. Um, they're associated with IDH1. However, they can have immunoreactivity for neuroendocrine markers. It's usually patchy. It's not usually strong and diffuse. And I will say, you know, the chromatin distribution is not quite neuroendocrine. And yet, is that really part, are, are the upper end of that particular category, are they part of a neuroendocrine carcinoma? I, I mean, I can talk about olfactory neuroblastoma. If you have a grade four olfactory neuroblastoma, is that also going to be defined differently? as a neuroendocrine carcinoma. I mean, it, it, olfactory neuroblastoma is a neuroendocrine tumor. It's a very specific one in a very specific anatomic site. So this is why I'm saying um, at this juncture, uh, some of the categories are still fairly well set, but there are others that are not really that well uh, classified yet, even though we do recognize them as entity types. Right, no, uh, thank you. And is there, you mentioned briefly about mixed tumors to so like, uh, similar to mixed neuroendocrine, non-neuroendocrine neoplasms in the GI right. and pancreas. Is there any category of that right now or it is? Uh... Yes, no, no, there, there definitely is. And that is incorporated into the book as well. Um, but, you know, if you, the, the most common for this is actually in the larynx where you have a squamous cell carcinoma and concurrently will have a neuroendocrine tumor. Usually it's a neuroendocrine tumor grade two, but um, those definitely do uh, exist within the head and neck space. But again, in the interest of time, you know, I didn't want to kind of muddy the waters too much by introducing too many different categories, but it is something that is still there, even though it's a very, very minor number of cases. Right. Uh, there's another question, uh, Dr. Thompson, that uh, regarding grade three and a uh, grade three NET and the neuroendocrine carcinoma, what is the difference from treatment perspective? Um, I wish I could answer that. <laughs> <laughs> because um, in the larynx, we have not used net grade three at this particular point. I mean, uh, several people have put out papers in the last year uh, with the introduction of the beta version to try and come up with this. The same thing with ear and temporal bone. But at this juncture, I'm not sure what the ultimate difference in management is going to be. And so... Um, with any classification, as you develop a new entity or a new category, you do need to see how is it going to fit with what we do um, management-wise for these patients. And so that's a, an area that needs additional work. Right. I think uh, these are the questions that uh, I could see online, uh, Dr. Thompson. And okay. And thank you so much for this great talk. And uh, you would be happy to hear that uh, you had an audience from all over the world. And we had viewers from as far as Ghana, Uruguay, Bahrain, Nigeria, Turkey, uh, India, Germany, Ireland, Slovakia, <laughs> Mexico, Philippines, Iraq, Cambodia, and US, of course, uh, to name a few. And thanks to our viewers. We appreciate Goodness. your support. And our next lecture is on. On November 17th, actually. So, and we will switch our gear. That would be a talk on GI pathology. And we will have Dr. John Goldblum, who is a, a chair of pathology at uh, Cleveland Clinic. And he's going to give a talk on Barrett esophagus. So, that is his favorite topic. 
and hope to that see That will be fantastic. Uh, John gives an excellent lecture no matter what the topic, so that will be good. Thanks very much, and I appreciate the people who are up at goodness knows what time of the day or night in order to be able to listen live uh, from the various countries you spoke about. So thanks very much, and have a great day. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, again, and hope to see you all next time, and hope we will have Dr. Thompson at another time soon. Thank you.